Good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Sunday for Sunday, July 9th, 2023. Hope you're having a great weekend. We've got members of the Media Academy of Financial Services and government standing by as we break down the news and events you need to know for the week. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. Well, we're going to kick things off with a look at what's happening on Capitol Hill in terms of legislation, litigation, arbitration, mediation. You know it. Uh, you know them as the Legal Eagles, Dave Levine, Kevin Walsh. Both are principals with Groom Law Group. That's an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, good to have you back. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. It's good to be on, Jeff. Thanks for having us on. Uh, listeners, you know, as we get into summer, it's uh, it's always good to you know talk with friends like Jeff Snyder, each week. Oh, that is so sweet. I appreciate that. Guys, I didn't pay them to do that either. Uh, David, let's pivot to you because I know we're going to shift gears. We're not talking necessarily retirement this week. I think we're going to talk a little health care. Uh, that's right. And my meditation this week, I'm trying to add to your <laughs> to your introduction, Jeff, Okay. Um, is the, I'll call it the great kerfuffle over health care fiduciary breach claims. What, where does this begin? Well, like a lot of the 401k fee litigation, there people sometimes ha- think that history begins on a certain date. And the reality is there has been litigation over healthcare in a million different ways for years. Ever since ERISA was enacted, ERISA applies to both retirement and health and welfare plans, including healthcare plans. The fiduciary rules of ERISA, there's no special, hey, healthcare is different, so the general fiduciary principles don't apply. It's not true. But at the same time, healthcare has always operated a little differently. Why? A couple of reasons. First of all, healthcare is uh, generally for, uh, for employers an unfunded type of solution. In other words, employees may pay premiums, but they, those dollars come in and you know, very quickly go right back out. Employers use general assets to cover differences or to pay for insurance premiums. There's two types of sort of common insurance structures. Uh, Administrative services only is sort of a shorthand for where someone self, a company self insures, maybe with stop loss insurance, but basically self insures and, and hires a health provider, which could be an insurance company, a third party administrator to basically handle claims and network issues but basically pays the cost, or you buy actual good old-fashioned insurance. We could spend a lot of time, but we won't talk about all the pros and cons of those. Why is this all relevant? Well, back in the Consolidated Appropriations Act several years ago, which led us to secure one type of era, the what we faced was the Department of Labor, from those of you in the retirement space, know we had gone through service provider fee disclosure in English 408B2, long ago. Mm-hmm. And 408B2 was one of those you know, regulations where the Department of Labor said, yeah, well, this is only re- we're only applying this to retirement plans as of right now. And they never brought it to health and welfare plans. But in the Consolidated Appropriations Act, they expanded 408B2 to, and they actually just dropped it in the statute to apply to healthcare plans. It applies to folks like brokers and certain parties. It's, it's a little bit differently scoped, but it's the same concept. And ever since then, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, is fiduciary litigation coming? When Jerry Schlichter made a comment that got picked up in the press about, oh, I'm looking at healthcare claims, that blew this topic up weeks ago. And that's where we get to today. There's a lot of things to go on here. And knowing that we've actually defended some litigation already in this, we had a lawsuit. I'm not going to get into all the details of it, where we actually won, where someone claimed about fee disclosure and everything. And we won that lawsuit. But it does highlight something that is of value. There is no requirement in a healthcare plan or a retirement plan, by that way, to have a committee. You can have a fiduciary in many different ways. 
But the takeaway from all this right now is think about your process. Obviously, it's a little different. Instead of a record keeper, you're selecting an insurer or an administrative services provider like a TPA or an insurer. But of course, you're negotiating costs there. There's a lot of ins and outs of, of this that we could get into. But the key takeaway is it's good to have a someone who's watching the store and negotiating and minding. But also remember that documentation of the actual plan is important. Again, it doesn't have to be identical to retirement. You don't need to create a billion policies. Sometimes we're an industry that creates paper in search of a problem. That's not, that's not what I'm saying here. But if you're a plan sponsor, yes, I have a lot of clients where they have a, their fiduciary committee also has authority over health, but there's so much that changes in health that they may, ha- they may delegate a lot of it, like claims. Most of that goes to the carriers and TPAs. So when you hear all this news, it sort of is an echo chamber. But remember, governance is a good thing, but it's not that the sky is falling. Kevin, to you. Yeah, so David, I mean, it, it sounds as though, it sounds as though, you know, if you're a, if you're running a health plan, it's worth being aware of what's going on in terms of fee disclosure and the fee litigation on the on the retirement side, but that, you know, some of the pressures might be somewhat different, but, you know, if, if there's a time to get your house in order, it's really now. I, I yeah. think that's, re- I think that's really well said, Kevin. And I think one thing to keep in mind, you know, the, what is settler, what is fiduciary? This, the sky is not falling here. I think it's important to recognize there's different rules, such there's, there's, there's different rules and considerations to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, I, I hadn't thought about healthcare plans in the same context of retirement plans in terms of having a committee, having a process. But now that I listen to you, gentlemen, yeah, you, you're, you're really, maybe it's not a committee, but you need to have a review process. You need to be able to document everything you do. Um, it sounds pretty important, especially healthcare costs going up. I mean, well, right? Well, you're right, Jeff, but there's, I think, and we, we shouldn't get too far into this because we could take hours or, and I know the listeners don't want to hear that. A lot of this is about the design of your plan. It's not about a fiduciary decision. And I say that because everybody's like, there. there's always a kernel of, yes, you have fiduciaries here, but a lot of this is about how you design your plan, which is settler. So before we all say the sky is falling, I think it's important just to recognize it's good to have processes regardless of whether it's settler or fiduciary, but they don't, but this doesn't automatically turn into the same as 401k fee litigation and fiduciary breaches. Because we defend these cases, I'm being very careful because there's a lot behind it. Mm-hmm. But the key, key point is it's not as black and white as the sky is falling. And I think we would strongly disagree with those who say, Oh, you're going to get sued in your healthcare plan because of X and Y. Could someone try to sue? Of course. But at the same time, understanding things and what the different roles are, it's good to understand that. And it's not just copy paste the retirement world in. Yeah. yeah really good point. Uh, I think a good, a good, I don't know, you want to call it a warning, a good, good information. I'll put it that way. Good information if you manage healthcare benefits and retirement benefits as well. Dave Levine, Kevin Walsh, thanks so much for stopping by. A little bit of a different topic today. Really appreciate it. And we look forward to having both of you back next week as well. Take care. Have a good weekend, gentlemen. Thanks for having us on, Jeff. And thank you, listeners. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy.
featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. Now we're going to take a look back at a recent episode where we talked about whether or not ESG investing is having a positive impact on the transition to renewable and green energy. And joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Andy Hira is with Simon Fraser University. He's also the author of The Smoke and Mirrors of Global CSR Reporting. Andy, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is this is great. And, and look, we've talked about ESG investing um, on this program before. This is not a new topic. This is an important topic. And I know you, you wrote a thoughtful piece, piece, I should say, for theconversation.com. ESG investing hasn't had the significant impact that many thought when it comes to gr the green energy transition. I want to get your thoughts on that. It's been a disappointment overall, and I think it's part of a larger disappointment around corporate social responsibility uh, for the past 20 years, and particularly since the 2008 financial crisis, business schools, investment funds such as BlackRock, uh, pension funds have all claimed that they're going to shift their investments towards very conscious decisions that will be ethical for uh, their pension holders and their stockholders. Uh, and so we've had an estimated 50% of Western global institutional assets supposedly oriented towards ethical purposes. And yet we don't really see a lot of changes in the world, whether it comes to climate change, uh, emissions, or uh, in terms of labor rights. I'm sure your listeners are all familiar with the stories from just a couple of years ago, where workers for Foxconn, which produces iPhones for Apple, uh, were committing suicide because of the horrendous conditions in the factory. Uh, and yet we don't have anything in place that ensures that companies will clean up uh, such practices. And I, I think that's a really good point. And when I look at it, look, I think you can look at the bottle and the label on the bottle and it makes a lot of sense. But then when you look what's the makeup of what's in the bottle, OK, sometimes the two don't always gel. And that doesn't mean it's a good or a bad thing. It means that there's more work to do. So let's talk a little bit about disclosure and how important disclosure is for these companies to make sure that they're actually, that companies are doing what they say they're going to do. I think that's a, that's a big, big concern for many. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's a class of what, classic, what we call an academic's collective action problem. Uh, you know, so if you think about a bus system, a bus system depends largely uh, or a metro system depends largely on the collective uh, voluntary self-enforcement of people. And the same is true of any tax system. Um, basically, there are a few audits, but for the most part, most people are expected to follow the system. And that is how the Paris Agreement is set up. 
And that is how a lot of these international agreements around corporate social responsibility are set up. Essentially, they're based on self-reporting where enforcement is supposed to be largely voluntary. Uh, because uh, there were so many repeated violations that occurred uh, with corporate scandals, including a major dam that uh, burst in Brazil, including the Rana Plaza factory uh, collapsed in, in Bangladesh, uh, where clothing manufacturers were, were revealed to uh, be part of substandard working conditions. There was the development of these new international systems like EITI, GRI, or Principles for Responsible Investment. And so now we have these international organizations like the UN or NGOs that are supposed to verify that companies are following these things. But when I started digging into how those international organizations actually uh, make sure that these corporate social responsibility codes are followed, I found that most of their funding are, is coming from the companies themselves. And they have very little capacity to actually check out these factories and enforce things. Uh, in fact, they rely on third party information. Um, what does an NGO really know about how a clothing factory should be run or the safety measures for it? So they haven't really solved the problem. Um, and in fact, they're suffering from a basic conflict of interest, the same conflict of interest as the financial rating firms in the 2008 financial crisis, who were rating the same bonds of the companies that they were receiving contracts from. Yeah, I, I mean, really, really good point. And, um, you know, is, is there a role here for here in the States? We've got the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, the Department of Labor has put in some regulations or created regulations for the inclusion of ESG in in retirement programs. But what's the role of you know, the role of the SEC is to create a transparent and open market, uh, generally speaking. So is there a role, uh, you mentioned the UN, you mentioned the IMF, those are world bodies, really, they don't have jurisdiction here in the States, tr traditionally. Again, I'm not a legal scholar at all, but but is there a role here for the, the SEC and the DOL here, uh, as it relates to U.S. and the use of ESG and sustainable investing? Yeah, absolutely. When we think about any market, ironically, it's in the market's interest to have stable regulation because, as you pointed out, if investors don't have confidence with uh, what investment companies or banks uh, or, or uh, multinational corporations say they're doing, then they're not going to invest the finance that the companies need to run. Um, the same is true for any kind of uh, situation, whether we're talking about workers' rights. We don't have child labor for the most part or slave labor in the West because we have regulation. Um, and we have an analogous problem with global taxation. As your listeners well know, there's all kinds of uh, shell corporations that hide corporate profits so that most uh, large corporations, including Disney, Apple, Microsoft, they have offshore shell companies. And so they pay virtually no taxes in the U.S., even though they enjoy public services like educated workers or infrastructure. So we have the same issues in regard to climate change. Uh, what we have is uh, what we would call a club problem. We have a handful of countries that are producing most of the climate emissions. So we can call them three large areas, uh, China, the U.S., and the EU. And if each of those entities started to actually regulate uh, both workers' rights and climate change emissions, you would see a dramatic change in the global nature of the problem. And so the SEC uh, and even Michael Bloomberg have championed the idea of having greater regulation and transparency around CSR disclosures in regard to uh, climate change emissions. And if they gain traction, that will be a game changer. Yeah. Well, we certainly appreciate Andy popping by the program and discussing this very important topic. We actually look forward to having him back on the program very soon. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, and drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more and all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, visit our website, and of course, all of our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN AM. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget... Roll with the changes.